Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab and the Breaking of the Ring of Steel. Or at least, that is the aim of the Loyalist High Command structure. Now having struck an uneasy yet relatively even balance between Carab Cullen and Legate Inquisitor John Dice Frame. Whilst the Inquisitor had just brought into the fold two more powerful military formations. First and foremost, the Star Phantoms, which had just arrived in full chapter strength. Yet another darkly renowned Astartes chapter introduced into the war via the Legate Inquisitor's connections. And also, the Titans of Legio Crucius from the Mechanicus world of Angstrom and the Magos and his Skitari formations. These reinforcements, these achievements, had tilted the balance of power within Loyalist command heavily in favour of the Legate Inquisitor. But the actions of the Salamander Captain Mirsan, a favoured lieutenant of Carab Cullen, in bringing the executioners in and having them surrender in person to the chapter master of the Red Scorpions had done a lot to even the playing field. And so now both parties were wondering how exactly to break through the Ring of Steel. The heavily defended multi-layered system of minefields of defense platforms and star fortresses that had been built up around the Badab system after the Orcs had humiliated the Astral Claws under their previous chapter master. Any frontal attempt against this epitome of imperial fortification craft would come at an excruciating cost, if it could even be breached at all with the remaining loyalist forces now that no further reinforcements were forthcoming. Imperials had been able to play fast and loose with their reserves for the majority of the war, but now at this crucial point, Cullen was perhaps beginning to have some doubts again. The tyrant had to be rooted out. Containment was not an option. It was merely allowing a potentially fatal wound to fester yet further. And yet, no good way to excoriate the stain presented itself. It was possible that a seed scenario might produce favourable results. The Loyalists had absolute void dominance, and anything the Astral Claws may have had that could conceivably challenge them in the void had been destroyed at Piraeus. As such, they could pick and choose their engagements. And as the primary threats to their warships were the defense platforms and the star fortresses, long-range torpedo attacks could be carried out from outside the range of most of the defending guns. And against a relatively stationary target with a predictable orbit, the chances of scoring a hit would be good were it not for the masses of point defense weaponry that the star fortresses and weapon batteries would unquestionably be covered in. Not to mention the presence of defensive squadrons of fighters and bombers, more than able to engage and destroy the slow lumbering torpedoes. It would place the Loyalist fleet at the minimum amount of risk, and so was a theoretical possibility, but... The reality would probably see the Loyalists run out of torpedoes before inflicting any real damage on the extensive Ring of Steel. And that was before one would take into account the possibility of blundering in to a minefield. The precise extent, location, velocity, and orbital pattern of which the Loyalists were practically clueless. 
Another option was to use again the relative advantage in maneuverability to drive a single vast assault straight down the secessionist's throat. Observe the ring for a period at first, determine the most likely area of a weak spot, and then simply just throw the entirety of the Loyalist's armada straight towards it. Losses would certainly be unavoidable, and more than likely heavy, but if the heavy Imperial warships took the lead, they could quite conceivably shrug off the enemy's fire for long enough for battle barges and strike cruisers to get within boarding torpedo, Ancestus assault ram and Thunderhawk range of the main star fortresses. After which it would be up to the Star Phantoms, the Red Scorpions, the Sons of Medusa, the Minotaurs and all the other Loyalist chapters to seize them and thusly neutralize their vast gun batteries as quickly as possible. If such a maneuver could be carried out with enough alacrity, the majority of the Loyalist Navy should still be operational at the end of it all. A bit of a bright and cheerful plan. Optimistic and hopeful. Ah uh, yes, hopeful. Not necessarily the kind of word you want associated with a battle plan that could make or break your entire campaign, I admit, but still, Adam Cullen was not exactly buried beneath a mountain of options. And as the demigod space marines discussed their options, Jandai's Frayne intruded on their conclave with a third alternative. A combination of both previous plans with a dash of inquisitorial intelligence. Now, admittedly, up until this point, the Legate Inquisitor's intelligence gathering operations had been almost as much of a danger to the Loyalists as it had to the Secessionists. But this time, Frain assured the gathered Space Marine captains that he had happened upon the key to unraveling the Ring of Steel. I imagine a, <laughs> a great deal of raised eyebrows met that assertion. But as the Legate laid out his plan, it began to make a certain amount of sense. The tyrant had become ever more paranoid, ever more brutal and capricious in his actions. And the recent desertions and seditious elements within the Astral Claws themselves um, had certainly not done anything to alleviate that character flaw. Frain instead argued that it would have exacerbated it, and he had received reports that nearly the entirety of the Ring of Steel was now controlled from one single centralized position, Sentinel Sigma, under the command of the Astral Claws Captain Corian Sumatris one of Lufthuron's closest and most trusted of lieutenants. Immediately, I imagine, several of the Space Marine captains would have objected to this. It seemed ridiculous to concentrate the entire command and control structure of such a vast defensive edifice in one singular area, instead of spreading it out over multiple smaller commanderies so as to ensure that there was no head to decapitate, seemed foolish in the extreme. The actions of a madman, certainly not the military genius that had ever so recently almost crushed the loyalists at the Piraeus system. And yet, the Inquisitor's reports were consistent. Picked captures, vox logs, and witness testimonies all described a state of mass purges carried out not just through the Badab system, but the entire Badab sector before the general fallback towards Badab Primaris. This had also been seen in the treatment of the populace of the Piraeus system, 
After the ambush, the Astral Claws had simply taken everything they could from Piraeus V and left the populace to starve. The once imposing Tyrant's Legion, as well, had become less and less of a danger on the battlefield as of late, due in large parts to a failure of leadership an ever closer integration between the Legion and the Astral Claws. This was an experiment that had been carried out on multiple occasions throughout the Imperium's history, and whilst one might logically think that placing mere mortals under the strategically brilliant tactical command of an Astartes would lead to an excellent fighting force, the reality every single time proved quite different as the mere mortals simply could not keep up with the Astartes. And so the mortals would drag the Astartes down, and the Astartes in turn would also endanger the mortals by expecting more of them than they could possibly achieve. There was also an ever-present danger that the Astartes would begin to view the mere mortals as just that, mere mortals cannon fodder, slaves, expendable resources. Another thing we saw on the lunar base in the Piraeus system. And if the tyrant had truly gone so mad as to leave millions to slow death by starvation, as to go so far as to purge his most loyal fighting men, as to go so far as to herd them at the enemy's guns as nothing more than bullet sponges. If he had gone so far, was it really so impossible to believe that a man who clearly saw enemies around every corner would place the entirety of the Ring of Steel in the hands of a single man, a strategically imprudent decision, but from a perspective of trust, perhaps the only one. Even if all of this was true, however, destroying Sentinel Sigma, the orbital fortress in control supposedly of the entire Ring of Steel, was easier said than done, and the Loyalists would almost certainly have to commit their entire Tire armada to the objective. And considering the frequently less than trustworthy nature of previous inquisitorial agent reports, that was asking a lot, and would also require the armada to expose itself to the full fury of the Ring of Steel's guns just for the potential chance that Sentinel Sigma really was the linchpin of the defences. It seemed as if the Conclave was right back where it started when Stebor Lazarek, the chapter master of the Firehawks, presented an alternative solution. A highly imaginative one, which even Karab Cullen could not help but approve of. 31, 17, 913, millennia 41. Aboard Sentinel Sigma, in orbit around Sigma, or Badab 6. Captain Corian Sumatris of the Astral Claws was aboard the station. He had been entrusted with the Ring of Steel by his chapter master, or more correctly, his tyrant Luft Huron. The entire system had been on high alert ever since the news of the failure at the Piraeus system had arrived. And shortly thereafter, the Tyran had returned to take personal command of the defences of Badab Primeres. The man himself continued to state that victory was assured. The feckle, rotting corpse of the Imperium of Man could not possibly hope to break through the Ring of Steel to extinguish the last, true hope of humanity resting within the Palace of Thorns. Corian Sumatris had his own private doubt about the inevitability of that victory. But as commander of the Ring of Steel, in charge of thousands of gun batteries, millions of mines, dozens of orbital fortresses, and hundreds of lance batteries, 
he could well understand a certain sense of invincibility. Whilst the wider war may very well be lost, the Darb Primaris was not likely to follow it any time soon. The Loyalists would eventually tire of maintaining their blockade, or the Astral Claws would find some way to slip through. And when they did, they could raid, they could pillage, they could steal, they could pilfer all the riches of the decrepit Imperium. Corian knew several of his brothers had acquired quite the taste for the reaving lifestyle, attacking Imperial supply convoys and logistical services behind their lines. And he would be a liar if he said that he did not see a certain charm in the lifestyle himself. Maybe once the Astral Claws found a way through, he would reconsider his loyalties, as many others had already done. Several Astral Claws vessels and warbands had simply never returned to Badab Primaris. Now yes, certainly some of them would undoubtedly have fallen afoul of the Imperium's dogs, but they knew this area of space like the back of their power-armored hands. The majority had undoubtedly gone to ground or in search of softer prey. And surrounded, as the captain was here on Sentinel Sigma, by the lowly mortals he grew more distasteful of day by day by ever passing day. The lure of independence grew stronger alongside it. To race across the void, to attack and plunder shipping, to tear apart the soft, disgusting morsels that inhabited these vessels and take their wealth for his own. Yes, that was certainly a fate much preferable to standing here, staring into blank monitors. But for now, there were duties still left. And he was not so unfortunate after all. A favoured man of the tyrant should choose his time to secede for maximum advantage and minimum risk. He already knew several well-placed captains that would undoubtedly leap at the opportunity to serve a new, worthier master. One that would give them what they truly wanted, instead of being cooped up here, nurse-maiding humans. The tyrant still saw too much value in them. Abruptly dragged from his reveries by blaring warning klaxons, the captain suddenly had something else on his mind, as a vast loyalist armada blasted into the outer edges of the system. Six battle barges, nine strike cruisers, and six Imperial Navy capital ships, along with 84 escort, light cruisers, and support vessels, ripped their way into reality on the outer edges of the Augur screens. And dwarfing them all, the monstrous, majestic form of the Raptorus Rex, leading the flotilla straight towards Sentinel Sigma. Corian's days of boring drudgery was most assuredly at an end. He would applaud the Loyalists. They had brought more warships than he had thought they could muster, and the Raptorus Rex at its head as well. A mighty fleet indeed, but no match for his guns. With air-splitting bellows, he ordered all weapon systems brought online, minefields brought to readiness first, and maneuvered into intercept formations against the enemy fleet. Then gun and lands batteries, and finally the orbital fortresses. The last and heaviest line of defense will be brought to bear when the enemy was hopelessly ensnared in minefields and mutually supporting fields of fire. The lapdogs of the Imperium had come to find their graves here, within sight of Badam Primaris. But the captain's glorious view of the future was interrupted yet again, this time by the pathetic mewling yappings of one of the humans. 
desperately pointing towards the view screens as if the captain had somehow failed to notice the emergence of a loyalist fleet. It was well within the expected tolerances of the Ring of Steel. There was nothing here to fear. Except that was an awfully strange energy signature just to the rear of the Raptorus Rex. Looking at the Augur apparatus, the captain would have expected a significant energy signature due to the behemoth's massive real space engines, but nothing near this level. Finally raising his head to gaze out through the usually pointless armor glass windows, the answer became very clear. Clear as day, in fact, as he saw towed behind the Raptorus Rex by some unknown Mechanicus magic, a piece of a star. The Magos of Angstrom had brought along with him so much more than just titans. He had granted the Loyalist access to the vast knowledge and technology of his system, of his tech adepts, and the depth of his armories, which had furnished Stebor Lazaruk with the necessary equipment to carry out his mad plan to rip out a part of a sun attach it to his Raptorus Rex, and tow it straight towards Sentinel Sigma. Real space engines blasting well beyond safety tolerances, the Raptorus Rex accelerated violently and began a brutal turn that strained even its ancient construction. Nearly tearing the ancient vessel apart, seams popping, rivets torn, and entire sections sheared from the superstructure, the Raptorus Rex turned, slingshotting a sun towards the Ring of Steel. The Astartes' mind is much quicker than that of a mere human, able to immediately react to changing tactical circumstances but I imagine even Corian Sematris's enhanced mind required a moment or two to wrap his head around just exactly what was happening. And no matter how quickly his mind may have raced to the conclusion, nothing could be done. By the time the Raptorus Rex separated from the sun it was towing, it was already on an inescapable impact trajectory towards the Star Fortress. The sensation of shock and frankly disbelief, however, was only momentary, and Korea and Sumatres ordered the second company of the Astral Claws to immediately stand by to repel borders and ordered every weapon within range to focus the entirety of their attention upon the incoming sun. Not that they had much choice to begin with. The Loyalist Armada following in behind the stellar body was shielded by its huge corona, and the sheer amount of radiation that leaked off its surface constantly, only exacerbated by thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of weapon impacts upon its surface and its corona. Lance batteries, gun batteries, torpedoes, mines, all of them were hurled against it, the overwhelming majority exploding long before it even got close to the heart of the sun closing in on the orbital fortress. And in turn, the countless detonation added yet further interference, whiting out nearly the entire battlesphere, rendering loyalists and secessionists alike de facto blind to everything but the incoming sun. It wasn't until it had gotten dangerously close to the orbital fortress that weaponry finally started penetrating through the corona and impacting on the main body of volatile plasma. At near point blank range, a concentrated flurry of lance batteries, nuclear missiles, plasma cannon shots, and lance strikes finally managed to penetrate into the depths of the unstable stellar phenomenon and blow it apart from the inside. 
Sentinel Sigma had barely by a rat's whisker avoided complete obliteration, but the detonation of half a star at near point blank range showered the station in radiation and debris. Its already near overloaded and flaring void shields had no chance to stand up to this kind of firepower, literally in this case, and it was swiftly overwhelmed, the surface of the station being scoured meters of armor plating being stripped away and nearly all auger antennas and sensor equipment was rendered completely inert. But Guardian Sematris knew damn well what would be following hot on the heels of this the Firehawk's most impressive of stunts. And it didn't take long until violent impacts and shudders that ran through the station confirmed his suspicion. The Sons of Medusa and Exorcist chapters had arrived via boarding torpedoes and assault rams. Fastening his helmet and turning away from the now pointless and mostly blown out instruments of the bridge, the captain of the Astral Claw's famed second company went out into the hallway to join his command squad and sell their lives as dearly as they could. Meanwhile, outside in the still cold yet now brightly illuminated void, the rest of the Loyalist Armada raced past Sentinel Sigma at full burn, heading for other objectives in system. The most important of these strike forces were the twin battle barges Sword of Ordon and the recently arrived Star Phantom's Memento Mori. Leading a strike cruiser wing, they were to take all the other star fortresses in the Ring of Steel. Without the central command and control structure on Sentinel Sigma, they were as good as blind and deaf, and the loyalists could approach them almost completely completely unmolested, the majority human crew aboard standing no chance against the invading space marines. The secondary and tertiary objectives of the Loyalist Armada then fell to the Minotaur's chapter. With Lord Asterian Moloch at its head, it moved towards Badab Secundus and Rigael. Secundus had once been a major populated world with a vast population. However, after having had its atmosphere irreparably damaged, it was now a dead, toxic planet, with the remaining population expected to number just over a billion, all lived in vast armored habitation colonies, not meant to withstand a real assault the Minotaurs deployed their main strength nevertheless towards this objective, as Regal or Badab III had never been populated, nor could it, as the atmosphere was outright corrosive and would simply eat away any structure foolishly placed on its surface. Instead, there was a tertiary class shipyard facility in orbit above the planet, with some 3.1 million civilians and laborers. If opposition proved tougher than expected, the Minotaurs would simply just pull back and crush it from orbit, as it had no defensive capabilities of its own, trusting in the Ring of Steel to protect it. Meanwhile, on Badab Secundus, resistance was spirited but inadequate, the majority of it made up by demoralized Tyrant's Legion forces, and a handful of Astral Claws formed up around their chaplain, one Varna Sabin, who had turned Badab Secundus into his pulpit, from which to preach to the once secessionist's mini-empire. But with the arrival of the Minotaurs, the last few vestigial shadows of that empire were now swept away. The Tyrant's Legion was crushed, and the Chaplain and a small bodyguard of Astral Claws uh, humiliated. With the Chaplain being made to send one final message, as Asterian Moloch 
personally impaled him to the front of his land raider. A fitting fate for all traitorous curs, no doubt. Sentinel Sigma would not go so easily, however. Valen Karl, Iron Thane of the Sons of Medusa, led the boarding action himself. And despite the Sons of Medusa and Exorcist's chapter outnumbering the Astral Claws garrison significantly, they fought with the advantage of home ground, turning every corridor into a killing field, deploying heavy combat servitors and automated weapon systems, even filling entire sections of the orbital with virulent poison gas. The Astral Claws' second company made the Loyalists pay dearly for every inch of their station that they wished to seize. But with complete void dominance and no operational weaponry on the station to contest it, Valen Kal could easily redeploy his troops. Thunderhawks and Cestus assault rams would pick up his squads and move them rapidly outside the edges of the station. If a corridor was blocked off, it would almost immediately be flanked by other boarding squads. If an area was flooded or filled with poisonous gas, it too could be circumvented until the Astral Claws found themselves pushed deeper and deeper within the station in an ever smaller perimeter, abandoning the outer sections entirely, hoping to hold on to the central data cores and the command bridge. Over the course of many hours of hard fighting, choke point after choke point was seized by the sons of Medusa's Terminators, wading into the hailstorm of bolt of fire, splashing it harmlessly off their dreadnought armor and storm shields. Exorcists and regular sons of Medusa following them in to clear room after room. Flamers, melter guns, plasma weaponry, and bolters all roaring in a constant cacophony until finally the captain of the Astral Claws, second company, and the commander that mere hours before had been oh so bored of his duty, Corian Samatus, an expert swordsman in his own right who had claimed the lives of countless loyalists, met the Iron Thane in single combat and was finally found wanting. Standing atop a mound of the broken, battered, crushed, power-armored corpses of loyalists and secessionists alike, he could finally vox to Carib Cullen that Sentinel Sigma had been seized. With the station now secure, Several high-ranking officials from the Mechanicus of Angstrom teleported on to the station and began the real plan. Their intent was to subvert the Silica Animus. The thinking cogitated at the heart of the station, and indeed at the heart of the entirety of the Ring of Steel, and bend it to the Loyalist cause. Normally this would have been inconceivable, flat out impossible, for the Mechanicus to allow anyone to mess around with such a precious machine. But again, whatever prize the Legate Inquisitor had offered the Archmagus of Angstrom, it must have been incredible indeed. As soon, the cogitator station had been broken open and invaded by those brought along by the Maguses, and the many machine spirits kept within the center of Sentinel Sigma was laid bare to the Loyalists. And so, for a second time that day, the Madab system lit up in a brilliant display of pyrotechnics as Carab Cullen ordered the entirety of the minefield surrounding Badab detonated. It must have been one hell of a sight. With the remaining system defense platforms and orbital fortresses now either under direct control of the Loyalists via boarding parties or subverted by the machine spirits, of the Angstrom Megasus. Complete control over the Badab system was now firmly in Cullen's hands. 
there was still a handful of things left to be done. There were a handful of system defense craft still remaining that needed to be hunted down and destroyed. But this small errand could be left to the Imperial Navy. The battle barges and strike cruisers of the Astartes headed immediately towards Badab Primaris to throw up their own ring of steel around it, lest the tyrant realize the error he had made. In entrusting all defensive capabilities to a single station and attempt to flee. Though a cautious distance still had to be maintained. Once the defences of the Rings of Steel were now completely done for, but Dub Primaris was still possessed of plentiful defences. Large torpedo silos buried deep beneath armoured bunkers in the heart of mountains, and lance cannon batteries the size of small cities dotted its surface. Any orbital bombardment would not only be futile, but extraordinarily costly. And the Loyalists had not come out of the engagement entirely unscathed. Though their navy had received precious little damage, the Raptorus Rex, which was intended to lead the assault against Badar Primaris, was not able to do so. The strain of hauling a chunk of a star across the cosmos had taken its toll on even such an unbelievable vessel. The strain placed upon its potent engines had pushed them well beyond all safety concerns. And the final dramatic maneuver to hurl the star towards the ring of steel had outright destroyed some and crippled others. For a ship the size of the Rex, maintaining a stable bombardment orbit was difficult at the best of times, and now it would have been nothing but suicidal, guaranteeing the plunge of the vessel into Badab's upper atmosphere. And whilst the effects of dropping an entire star fortress onto the Palace of Thorns would undoubtedly have been spectacular, Stebor Lazarek was unlikely to approve of such drastic measures. And so, once more, one final time, the Loyalists were going to have to go down onto the planet and dig out the last of the Astral Claws and the tyrant himself. A beast is at its most dangerous when cornered. And I am sure the tyrant will prove to be no different as we wrap up the War for Badab next week with the last assault and also the Trial of the Warders chapters. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching. And I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.